You were taught to believe in a safe and predictable world. When were you attended ball games, parties, and school without fear of harm? But what if, in a moment, that world was shattered by the murder of your loved one? What would you do, and how would you go on? Welcome to the Grief Relief Show with mother-daughter team doctors Gloria and Heidi Horsley, brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation, helping people find hope after loss. Now, here's Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi. Welcome to the Grief Relief Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. The Grief Relief Show is a special show because it's a show for you, about you and the traumas that have happened in your life. We know that with Newtown and a lot of the other disasters that have come along recently, that a lot of you do have trauma, and a lot of you have had trauma, and you have events that have come up. And today, we've got some great people and some experts that are going to be on to help you. Hi, Mom. Well, we are a mother-daughter team, and we do a weekly series, and we are very excited about our guest today. Uh, we've got Dale Larson, right? You want to yes. talk about Dr. Dale? Dr. Dale Larson, and I recently saw him on the news because he is an expert on traumatic loss, mm -hmm. and he was speaking about New the Newtown tragedy, and he speaks all over the country and actually all over the world and writes about traumatic loss, and he'll be talking to us a lot today, and he's also a university... A, professor at Santa Clara University. Wow. Well, Dale, uh, quite a story we've been hearing about, oh. uh, you know, murder and those kind of things. I wanted to ask you, I happened to meet a man the other day and uh, while I was waiting to have lunch with a friend, and I stopped and talked to him and asked him how he was doing, and he said, good. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, Heidi and I, my daughter, do a, a grief mm -hmm. show on mm -hmm. public access. And he said, oh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, and I said, we're doing a show on trauma. And mm -hmm. he said, uh, all of a sudden he stopped and he said, well, I had a trauma. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, really? And he said, yeah, 9-11, I was in the building right next door to mm -hmm. the Twin Trade Towers. And he said, I remember this guy, it, mm -hmm. the, the plane hit, we thought it was a bomb. And he said, we all ran to the window and looked out. We were in the next building. He said, I saw a man fly down, jump mm -hmm. off the top of mm -hmm. the building. I'll never forget. And he, the, the guys are telling me this. His necktie went up in the air like this, and then the man opened his coat and said, see the lining of mm -hmm. my jacket? Mm -hmm. I could see the lining of his coat. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and then I saw the plane hit the second tower, and I could tell you what the tail mm -hmm. number was on that plane. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have not talked about this mm -hmm. since for 10 years. Mm -hmm. He says, this is the first time I have told this story. He mm -hmm. said, when it first happened, I was telling everybody. Mm -hmm. So what about that? This, you know, what about that trauma? Is it okay? And he basically looked at me. I knew what he was asking me. Is it okay? Am I okay that I haven't told the story? That, that, that's a really great question. What, I think it's just really okay that he encountered you. And what he saw was someone who could listen to yeah. this experience. He just yeah. knew that you could listen. I heard that with R Rada was sharing also. She was saying how hard it is sometimes to talk about this. One thing, one of the things we know uh, from research on all this is that there are incredible social constraints against disclosing these things because the rest of the world isn't really ready to hear about it. They, the responses are consistently n kind of changing the topic, turning away from you a little bit, and you get the message. There, it's not an uncaring response, although it, it feels that way sometimes. But people aren't ready to really engage with that. They don't know how to respond. And that's why compassionate friends, and that's why uh, running into to you right. <laughs> and, and um, uh, finding other people who can, and counselors and other people who can really provide the kind of empathy and, and compassionate friends, you have that instant empathy, right. which is just invaluable because you need to feel understood. You know, I want to say that, you know, I think you end up feeling in these experiences so completely alone mm -hmm. and you feel, uh, we call it the fallacy of uniqueness in research, the belief that I alone am having this experience, but no one else could possibly be having this experience. It's so strange, bizarre, unusual, awful. And then we keep it inside, and we'll, our friends cannot provide all the support. I think friends are great, family is great. But, you know, after about the second or third luncheon meeting with your friend, <laughs> yeah. they're yeah. saying, well, are you over the loss of your, right. s are you getting over it? Are you getting back to normal? Right. <laughs> they wa everyone wants you to get back right. to normal. But, but normal, but normal is what you used doesn't to exist be. anymore. Right. It's what you used to be. It's what you normal. used to be. What you used but to be. you had a dividing line in your life. There was this part of my life, and then there's this other, which everyone tells me, every brief parent tells me that they had life before the event, 
and then there's life after the event. And right. they're totally... The, like they say you have to create a new normal. And like you new said, normal. yeah, we don't yeah. just get over it. We, tra we learn to transform it. Yeah. You, transform you know, it. one of the things that's interesting with the 9-11 study that Heidi's been working with at Columbia, it, you've been following those widows for how many years we, and families? We followed them for 10 years. Yeah. So they had, it's kind of interesting, they had an opportunity to talk about it for 10 years mm -hmm. and have somebody who was interested in saying, how are you doing? Would, uh, yeah. And they're doing pretty well too, aren't they? They are, but it took a lot longer than the world wants to feel that it does. It, it takes a long time when we love someone so much to fully, you know, find hope again and also who, to embrace our new identities. Who are you without Christopher in your life? Who am I without Scott? You know, so it takes longer. I think. Uh, I think it does, and I think that one of the things that we found in research is that uh, growth and distress coexist, mm -hmm. so that That's you're not point. distress free. Yes. You can still cry when you see that you're moved. But that's I think because we still have that, those connections, and and now the the field is really saying we need continuing bonds, but we've got to find a way to carry the person in our heart where so that we're not having extreme reactions every day. Right. right. But we also don't lose touch, so that we can have um, that that love that we feel for this person without all the distress, which well, is the the ultimate. Hi, my name is Anthony, and my question is for Adele, uh, Doctor. I was wondering. After someone experiences trauma who's close to me, what is the best way for me to help them out? Great question. Um, I think it's a question we all ask ourselves. It, it, and we're all thinking, oh, I'm not a trained counselor. I'm not a therapist. What can I possibly do? But you know, the, I think the same pr principles apply, which is really being available and listening. You can't get in any trouble listening. You can't listen your way into trouble. And you don't have to really do anything. Human presence is healing in itself. Um, and you, w one of the things we know about trauma healing is that we have to find a way to be with that in some relationship to it while we feel safe. And another human being, a caring person who has caring for us, being with us in that moment that we're with our experience is, is a, a healing experience. Um, so uh, Henry Nouwen, who is a theologian, wrote about the difference between zero and one. And you know, the, the one is very important. And I think that that's very important that you show up. So my, mm -hmm. my message is really, we have to show up for people who are experiencing these things. We have to, if they want support, if they, they, they feel that they, they are having a little trouble with it and they want to talk, I believe that everyone should have an opportunity to get support. I think it's very important that we as a culture provide that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you ask bereaved people and people who have been traumatized, um, how, how were the responses of others? The majority of responses people report are not very helpful mm -hmm. because they're giving advice. They're, 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 we're trying to be helpful in all the ways we're normally helpful. Let's problem solve. But you can't problem solve this. Uh, you can't just take it and say, let's do this and do that. You have to show well, up. The helper's journey, working with people facing grief, loss, and life-threatening illnesses. Great. My name is Marty, and my question is for um, Dale. What do you feel, how do you feel about people who have experienced um, a traumatic loss taking antidepressants? Uh, what we often find is that we think they're really being helpful because we are um, having this placebo effect. And they, in conjunction with counseling or compassionate friends, um, seem to work better. Um, there are some medications that are being recommended for trauma versus uh, major depressive disorder versus uh, prolonged grief disorder, which we haven't really had any pharmacotherapy for. Um, but my basic stance toward it is um, you have to really consult with folks in medicine work with somebody who understands that grief is not depression because this is one of the primary confusions that happens out there. Um, and uh, primary care providers here, your basic primary care physician, uh, very often it's tough for them in the 10 minute session to really figure out, well, are you depressed or are you grieving? And now we have with the DSM-5 with the bereavement exclusion being removed, which is happening in April of this year. Um, we're going to have a situation where um, there is a potential for more antidepressants being prescribed. So the physicians have to really be, get more education that they're not going to be prescribing them for things routinely. And we also have to um, 
we'll really ourselves kind of look at how can we get support for ourselves. And I think that these, there there's, can be some role for major uh, depression of antidepressants. But I think when we look at the research, we see that uh, for mild to moderate depression, it isn't really. And, and I think that the, if you look at bereavement, uh, that we know that uh, in th Norway, 78% of mothers who had lost their children qualified for a complicated grief diagnosis. A so I, I you have just a, you know, and, and every and every day uh, bereaved people are having pretty high levels of depression, and in the first six months, five months, you have very frequent, frequ high frequency of major depression. I guess this has been the Grief Relief Show, hosted by mother-daughter team Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley. This show has been brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation, helping people find hope after loss. Be sure to visit opentohope.com, where you can listen to radio programs, watch Open to Hope TV, read articles, and view books. You can also join Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi on Twitter and Facebook and put your events on their international calendar. Thanks for watching, and remember, others have been there and made it. You can too.